Hi, everyone. This is Ari Yu, Chair of the Cascadia Blockchain Council and also Co-Chair of the U.S. Blockchain Coalition. I'm also your host for Windshield Time. We had a really great presentation with the community. Um, I My co-presenter is Nurav Desai, CEO of Moonbeam, and they were the ones that did our report. So this is our presentation. Uh, we go through the executive summary of the state of Web3. This is a report produced by the US Blockchain Coalition in partnership with Moonbeam. And uh, we go through it page by page and uh, answer questions from the audience. So hope you enjoy. Thank you for watching and or listening to this podcast. And if you wanna check out the real report, uh, the link is provided in the uh, notes below. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Together we rise. Bye. I'm Nick. So I'm at the Washington Technology Industry Association. Quite a fancy gear. Uh, so we, one of our prime focuses is around Web3, as many of you know. Um, so we have been working with ARI and the U.S. Blockchain Coalition. ARI wears many blockchain hats, but uh, in this conversation, I guess you're wearing two hats in this conversation, both Cascadia and U.S. blockchain groups. Um, but uh, I'm going to introduce Nero. So Nero is the CEO of Moonbeam. He's done a bunch of different reports for us. Uh, he did one on the quantum information, uh, quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications, quantum information science broadly last year. And then we have a recently released State of Web 3. And so goal today is to talk to us about that report, talk about kind of what the findings are for Washington. Uh, and you know, if I were to have questions, hopefully make this pretty conversational. But, uh, Otherwise, you'll all get an email from me or Lainey after the event, tell you more about WTIA, and give you all free memberships if you're not already a member, and maybe you are. Uh, I'm gonna see it. Uh, what are the benefits of a free membership? Yes, yeah, so the benefits depends a lot on the type of company you are, but if you're a startup, uh, we have accelerator resources, a lot of educational resources, we help make connections to investors, service providers, we have product discounts, we've given out a lot of Amazon's cloud credit money, um, and Carta, HubSpot, discounts like that. Uh, if you're more on the enterprise side, we do public policy work, we run a national tech apprenticeship program, and then kind of spanning from small business to mid-size, we offer HR benefits, uh, other services like that. So uh, for Web3 and blockchain, our goal is to make Washington and the Cascadia region the best global hub for this kind of work. So uh, I'm not gonna use specific like mission statement because we were literally workshopping it right before this uh, event, because I haven't synthesized yet, but Basically, we should be number one. Um, and as we're going to go through this, we'll see some of the different rankings and how we kind of stack up on uh, the innovation index. And so, our goal is to figure out how we get to number one on those categories. Um, so, with that, Harry, I'll turn it over to you to talk about more interesting stuff. Great. And since we have a small, intimate group here, come close. We will not bite or snarl. Uh, we want to make this as friendly as possible and uh, you know, have a good discussion, take in some good questions. Uh, between myself and Narav, and also Nick, uh, we'll be able to find an answer or you know, work to be able to get you an answer somehow. So uh, definitely please take advantage of that. Before we begin, we're gonna talk, do a quick little bit of intros. Um, we met Nick, and so Nick was a very big piece of this report. We decided, um, working with the WTI, did you know the WTIA is the largest tech industry association in North America? Pretty big deal. And so we have the WTIA right here. Membership is free. Uh, be a part of the community and you know engage because that's how we create that one voice. Uh, myself, I wear many different hats. I am also the chair and founder of the Cascadia Blockchain Council. We do a lot of work here in the Pacific Northwest and Washington specifically. Um, always looking for people that want to engage. Um, if you want to volunteer your time. There's a lot of leadership opportunities, lots and lots. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you have time, you know, two to five hours a week, always looking for good people. And then uh, the other hat that I wear is um, chair and also co-chair and co-founder of the U.S. Blockchain Coalition. We started this back in 2021 when I called Lee Bratcher out of Texas and I said, hey, is this a Democrat or Republican thing? Like, why is your governor loving this stuff so much? And why am I having so much trouble here in Washington? And we started talking and we're like, wait a minute. Is this the first time the states are talking? That shouldn't be the case. So a few days later, we had 10 states on the call and we're all talking to each other. You know, Florida, California, Texas, you know, Washington, Oregon. 
And then we're like, wait a minute, we know more people than this. So literally a, a month later, we had 30 states on a call. And ever since then, we've been meeting every month. We have about 46 states, uh, plus Puerto Rico, Washington, D.C., and U.S. Virgin Islands right now. And so I think by the next couple of months, we'll be 50 states strong, plus you know a few more of the U.S. territories and protectorates. Um, and that's sort of like where I am. And Nara, what is your background, and how did you get into this space, and for you. Yeah, so I'm Mira Basai. I run a company called Moonbeam. We uh, basically connect innovation supply with innovation and demand um, through a variety of mechanisms. But uh, the key element that we that we apply to uh, tech scouting, searching, helping corporations find the right company to start up to work with. Um, but it was based on my work prior to starting Moonbeam with a large consulting firm, Louis Allen. Um, uh, Again, helping startups get into the federal space and with large corporations. What we kept on finding was, number one, startups um, didn't know where to start. They didn't go after enterprises because they thought that the sales cycle time was too long. And uh, they relied heavily on relationships that didn't give them a lot of cost to broaden. From the other side, from the CVC side, or the corporate innovation uh, side, they rely heavily. They rely heavily on personal networks, and when those people leave, usually go work for a startup. Their whole network leaves with them. Um, so we built a data science platform that pulls together over 100 innovation indices, and we're now using that to, to map things like uh, emerging technology areas uh, and what's going on in, in those spaces. So um, uh, we worked with uh, WKI before. I've been uh, on in emerging uh, tech, particularly with. Uh, blockchain, uh, cryptocurrency, and uh, VR for a while. So when it came to doing uh, something around Web3, it just made sense. And then I have to do another like kudos for Nirav and his team. Like, yes, Booz Allen, like they're a super, super smart team, but also like really great people to work with. Like when you want work with a group, I'm just like a WTIA, when you work with a group of people and you build a partnership, you want to feel like they're in it with you and they care. And they care not just about the project, but they care about the people too. Like, I can't say enough about Moonbeam. Um, the team was just incredible to work with and uh, did all sorts of black clips to help us get this through. So, uh, you know, like, major props to you and your team. It's a mutual admiration society. All right, okay, so. All right, that's us. <laughs> yeah, so this is us, uh, but uh, when, happy to send you all a full 108 pager of the report. It's a really big report. We're just going to go over the executive summary today uh, with a couple of slides on just Washington State specifically. But one of the things that we'd like to do differently compared to what has been done in the past is we targeted this report to what you may call normies or people that are more critics of this space. And so when we built this, we thought, okay, well, let's put everything up front. Like we have to earn trust. So who worked on this report? Ta-da! And who are these people? Let's just give people bullets and give you a sense of who these, these people are, these being us and you know, the rest of the research team. Um, and I think this is something that isn't done enough, right? Like we're here to earn trust, not just demand it and expect it. And so, you know, every single thing that we do in our deliverables, our events, our programs, whatever we do, I think we have to do above and beyond right now, especially after FTX and all the stuff that's happened over the past, I don't know, 12, 18 months, we have to go above and beyond to earn trust uh, with people that are now skeptical about this technology in this industry. And so this is one of the ways we did that. You know, we were laying out who the team is. Uh, you know, these are all the states that we're working with right now. Um, you'll see like in green, these are the members of the steering committee, which represents the board. And so it's a state led, state member based organization. By the end of the year, like I said, we'll have about 50. Uh, we're still missing Nevada, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Delaware. So if you have any key, um, <laughs> yeah, please, please let me know. Um, oh, sorry, there you go. Oh, that's good. <laughs> So the Blockchain Coalition, uh, we have uh, this uh, quote by Justice Brandeis, the states are the best laboratories for democracy. You see hundreds of millions of dollars being poured in DC and all of that flight and going on in DC, it's not really moving very quickly, right? It's on purpose, it's by design. There's a lot of friction in the system there on purpose. And so 
what I really like us to do is put more of our attention back to our local communities, um, our our own states, and states are literally the best places for democracy. And so that's what we do in the U.S. Watching Coalition. We get on a call, we trade notes, highlights, lowlights. Hey, can your senators talk to my senators? Let's share talking points. Hey, that legislation just passed in Wyoming. Let's take it to Tennessee and Virginia and. You know, what did you learn from yours? Oh, this part didn't work out. I changed the verbiage here. And um, we see a lot of that great collaboration happening across the states. Uh, we don't really care if you're diehard blue as a state or diehard red as a state or purple. Um, we actually see each other as brothers and sisters and we get along really well. It it's, um, makes you believe in humanity again. You know? And you know, here I am, like middle-aged Asian lady too, right? Like, you know, with a bunch of random states, like, no, it really doesn't matter. Like people are really coming together because why? Why do we do what we do? I want to have a good home with my family, and I want to provide a great education for my children and be able to eat well and have a good life. So do we all across the states, no matter where you're coming from and what your background is. And that is really what aligns all the states together. Like this, this is the simple north star that brings all of humanity together. And so we share resources, we come together, and. Um, we hope that will be the backbone of a lot of these uh, policy related conversations across the states, whether it's Web3 or other technologies or other technology related conversations going forward. So uh, to the report, um, as I said, you know, we really have to earn trust, go above and beyond. And so we listen up front. These are all the people that under people, organizations that underwrote this report, right? Like, the WTIA, Coinbase, Block, Texas Blockchain Council, Blockchain Advocacy Coalition, that's the main group out of California, Alabama Blockchain Coalition, Virginia, and Providence Chain Network. And so these are all the underwriters that pay for the the report. And you know, why do we do this? Because you know, what are the incentives, right? Like this wasn't just commissioned by you know one one group. We tried to make it as um, um, broad as possible with having states participate and contribute, and which wasn't an easy thing because a lot of these, you know, if you look at Alabama or Virginia, these are relatively new state organizations. So for them to contribute, I think it says a lot. Um, you have, you know, more big incumbents like uh, blocking Coinbase. Uh, we also look at WTI as sort of like the big, right? Remember, it's the largest technology industry association in North America. And so we thought having a heavyweight organization like the WTIA representing so much of the tech industry would would be like the anchor that gives way to this report because it wasn't just you know fly by the night crypto you know web three people it was hey we also have to care about what we're saying because we have Google on the dock and we have Microsoft on the dock and they don't want us to just go and wing it so uh, you know that's what we're trying to portray with this. Table of contents, you can see it's a really large report, um, but you know, if you want the full report and you go through it, I, I highly recommend it because it gives you a lot of insights about what's going on across the United States and where the opportunities are and where there's opportunities for more conversation. So again, earning trust, going above and beyond. Um, I wish more reports would do this, and I think the more this becomes more standard practice, um, the better and more um, open hardly this sort of data can be received by those that are more critics of this space, right? So we documented the methodology, this is, the, this is your space. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, there's a lot of buzz. We wanted to get past the buzz around uh, uh, Web3, um, you know, and part of this comes out of just annoyance with the media coverage in this space, right? Um, it's all what's hot now. And we wanted to get down to their actual numbers. So we spent a lot of time normalizing across the data we could get, uh, digging to find where there were gaps and filling in those gaps. We're really looking across five dimensions. So that, what kind of activity is, is, is there in the startup space? What's going on in the investment community? Now, investors are investing in startups, but they have a very different perspective, so that data is a little bit different. Uh, what is coming out of academia? What are the, what's government doing, both from legislation, but more, more, more particularly for this report, is where are they investing, where are they, where are they signing contracts, um, and then lastly, um, 
Well, Joe, we're about to get um, any comments. That was a lot of fun. Oh, I um, But incumbents being, what are the, the big doing? Particularly in this space, what's the financial institution doing? What are the big tech companies doing? Um, uh, and how, how are they approaching this space? We looked at everything from patent activity to jobs to uh, research grants to um, uh, startup investment, kind of build out the, the net quantification behind these, and then peppered in with, with the um, you know, the, the story for each state as to what's unique about this state. Um, there could always be a lot more to, to research here. So, but what we tried to do is get a baseline across everything that's, that can be normalized across the states. Uh, clearly, there's a lot going on in California and Washington State as opposed to, say, Rhode Island or um, Wyoming. No, Wyoming's all right. Why can we get the luck? Um, oh, oh, yeah. There's a lot more going on in Washington State and in California than, say, uh, Alaska. Was, Alaska, was great, great. Be a great one. <laughs> um, so, but we tried to get a normal base, normalized base, and kind of so we could compare, compare apples to apples. Yeah. Uh, but then the bottom part is another thing: what is Web three? And that took a lot of going back and forth and figuring out, uh, talking with all the partners, where the partners um, helped a lot because each state viewed it slightly differently. Certainly, the the um, companies viewed it differently. So we came down to a common set of terms um, that kind of we use to define our search criteria. Um, and then, you know, a, an adjacency map based on that. Um, and uh, one thing is you'll notice, um, or I will note, is that we left out the word metaverse. Because metaverse, again, is another word that hasn't yet been quite defined. And so if you look at like the game World of Warcraft, that's considered a metaverse. Or remember the old game back in the uh, like 20, 30 years ago, Sims? That's considered a metaverse. Would you consider that Web3? So metaverse was left out. But you know, where there are terms that are very Web3-centric, like NFT, decentralized finance, Bitcoin, digital asset, verifiable credentials, stablecoin, tokenomics, those were all included. So um, the CHIPS Act, right, is the one uh, that was uh, commissioned yep. or set up by the U.S. Economic Development Agency, and it breaks out the uh, U.S. into six main regions, and so that's also how we mirrored how we broke out the regional uh, breakout of the states. Yeah, and this is pretty A lot of the value for this report I see is helping economic development agencies figure out their larger strategy and then apply for funding. Um, and we were talking about this about Montana earlier today. Uh, they're not in the same EPA zone as Washington State. That affects how you bid on a proposal or an earned grant. So we, we wanted to provide the numbers in a way that can easily be digested and used for economic development purposes. So now we create the wheel. <laughs> We're possible. Um, some outliers, you want to do this one? Yeah, yeah. So, this, this, so when, you, when you look at the report, there's a scorecard on every state. Um, I used to collect baseball cards back when I was young. We kind of used that as, <laughs> as the, the model. Um, but there's outliers, right? There's the all-star team. Um, and they're for different reasons. So um, we, we wanted to provide this to kind of highlight certain states and what they're doing that, that, are, that, are not, that weren't expected. Um, now, clearly, most activity, that is probably what we think of. I would say I, I hadn't thought about Florida up front, um, but there's a lot going on there, particularly in the Miami area. Yeah, well, I mean, I think especially with the pandemic, a lot of folks were like, well, I'm going to be working from home and there's nothing going on here. I'm moving to Miami where they basically had no pandemic there, right? And there was a lot of academic, uh, economic activity going on and Mayor Suarez saying like, Miami, Miami. So we did see Florida up there in the rankings. Yeah. Um, on the, this is another interesting one. We, we were able to map for the startups where they're investing and particularly highlighting, because uh, there is so much global activity in, 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 in Web3, um, that it was interesting to see where that money is coming from, where Asia's investing, where Europe is investing, um, and where, where America's investing, North America's investing. What was interesting is Texas, despite having a lot of activity, has very little international investment. Same thing with Georgia. Uh, whereas, uh, and we'll get the numbers up, I believe, on, on this, um, it tend to be upward of 20%. Which is uh, really in most high. Other states. Really 
really, really high because I think um, most startups um, and have investors that are mostly like US based, especially for the first like couple rounds of funding. Uh, but in Web3, the startups are getting a significant amount from international investors, which I think also makes sense because Web3 is global 365 days a year. Yeah. On the government investment side, that's another. Um, I think governments is an area that we've been specializing a lot in. It's often overlooked, particularly if you get further west. Um, but in, in, in core or in, in core technology, uh, particularly early stage, governments it, it played a huge role in, in subsidizing that through grants from universities and direct SBIR commercialization grants in, uh, of that technology. What we saw is there are notable states that have very little commercial activity, but are surprisingly doing a lot on the, from the government side. Alabama is an interesting one, um, namely because it's a lot of NASA out there, a lot of Army. And Army is using um, uh, blockchain to, uh, or experimenting with blockchain around tra tracking parts logistics in province. Uh, really interesting use case and a good amount of money being spent. So it's just kind of a, an outlier that um, kind of stands out, particularly companies like the province that might be interesting. Yeah, and Alabama was one of the funders of this report. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say I didn't expect that. I think people in the industry might might feel otherwise, Wyoming, for example. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, these are states that don't often end up high on per capita. New Jersey might be an exception there. But, um, you know, in the blockchain, in the blockchain space, Web3 space, Nevada's doing a lot, uh, Delaware, Makes sense with the financial center there, but uh, Wyoming and uh, Utah really kind of punched above their weight. Um, and then lastly, um, there are a few states that really focus on particular areas. Um, when you uh, Tennessee with the large healthcare center in, in Nashville makes makes sense. Um, Nevada with the combination of gaming and gaming. This is also something I've seen internationally. Uh, Malta is doing a lot around combining. Gaming and gaming, um, uh, but you know the the, the casinos, uh, the gaming corporations are, are very much looking at this um, technology, um, but they also have a large um, metaverse flavor to uh, the way they're looking at um, at uh, Web three, and then Maryland um, clearly government, um, and almost all of their activity is around government related. Is it around tech? I'm sorry. Government use cases. Government use cases. Maryland, yeah. All right, can you guys hear me in the back? Or you okay, I'll see about that. Come closer to me. Okay, let's get one. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I think a lot of uh, folks, especially those that have been around for quite some time, we've always been looking for these use cases to come from startups. Um, but what we saw through this report was uh, a lot of the activity and application of the Web3 technologies is actually going to be coming and has been coming from the enterprises. Sort of this like love-hate relationship we have, right? As the, you know, like for the people, by the people, and oh, big companies, and they have billions and billions of dollars. What do we say here? Well, so the, <laughs> there's two aspects that. One is incumbent investment, so where enterprises are investing heavily. Second is, there's a lot, while we hear in the press a lot about hey, this new cryptocurrency is taking off or this N NFT uh, craze, what's really been the silent story here is that enterprise use cases um, are have steadily increased. There's nothing flashy, nothing huge, but um, you know, when, when healthcare, the healthcare industry pilots a solution and it gets into um, a few hospitals and it gets into a few, um, insurance providers, that's sustained and, and, and um, growth that is really the uh, undercurrent of the whole industry. Yeah. Uh, and then the numbers bear it out. 7% um, uh, of all U.S. unicorns are um, Web3 technologies, um, and a lot of those are enterprise companies. And when you think about this technology, it's not sexy, right? It's not supposed to be sexy. It's supposed to be behind the scenes. And like the biggest players and the biggest use cases should be enterprises and government. So um, it's actually like reassuring to see that this is growing year over year. So the question, so uh, the year is from year 2007. Yes, so 
this way earlier than what we put through? Well, those terms weren't like, don't come up in the search criteria before like that time. Yeah, so a lot of, while well, the technology, uh, well, the, the core tech that led to Web3 to Web really started around 2007. So we're going back to even government grants in that space that led to core technology. Um, the patent applications at one or another. What happened in year 11? Because that is an interesting spike for me. That is an interesting spike. So 11, I can't say offhand. 15, 16, that was the, the craze around um, uh, when uh, blockchain was taking off massively. I'm uh, sorry, Bit block, point, uh, Bitcoin was taking off. Are taking off, and then we started seeing the uh, the alt crazes here this year, yeah. and then the NFT craze is right here. Yeah. I'm not sure offhand what was in 2011. I can look that up. It was right before the big crash, and it wasn't in like 2012. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Was it like right before like the, like like a lot of companies had been to layoffs right right around 2012? So it's probably tons of interest, and also the layoffs happened all the yeah. You know, with tight down spending <laughs> in the last few years. Okay. This talks about uh, this talks about uh, uh, incumbent activity. So again, we spoke focus a lot on startups, but startups are critical to the they are the innovation economy. In a core technology that can upend financial institutions. What the large banks are doing is pretty critical. Uh, a, a lot of the middleware providers, what they're, well, how they're investing is critical. And then clearly, if you're going to have systemic change in the healthcare system or the global supply, supply chain, you're going to need to come. So we spent a lot of time looking at that. Um, bottom line, though, um, jobs are, people are being employed in the uh, web, uh, web3 ecosystem. I think the uh, number is like 200,000 jobs have been created. I mean, this number, you have to take it with a grain of salt because it's really hard to narrow down on uh, job data. But it, about 200,000 jobs in the US have been created from the Web3 space, which is a big number. Um, and so, you know, as we talk to policymakers, it's not just onesie, twosie little companies here and there. It's, it's a significant number of people that are affected. And uh, policymakers should care about jobs, right? <laughs> so it should be, yes, you know. I was surprised. These are these are positions that were open as of July. So this is not a complete list, but a, there's some pretty big names up there that are hiring uh, blockchain engineers. And correction, not just all engineering as well. Blockchain related as well. Yep. Oh, this is the uh, stat. So 29% of all investors in the Web3 space are coming from international. That's twenty one percent of U.S. companies have that's huge uh, international investments. I, I think that's really, really big. And then you know, we're like, whoa, what does that mean? So you know, the breakout is eleven point nine five percent is coming from Asia, eleven point two percent is coming from Europe, and then there's the other, which is like Brazil and Canada. But uh, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and you know, as we talk about like homeland security and how the government views and what's going to happen in the future as we roll out our our changing viewpoint on globalization and money and where it comes from, like these are things that we need to take into account as you know entrepreneurs and investors and just community members of how this affects us and you know where, what is this going to look like in the future. You know, this is an area that I think American startups don't think as much about uh, because often so much of the investment is domestic. Europeans have been thinking about this for a long time, but they constantly look overseas for funding. Um, but as uh, the venture space diversified from the six cities that control half of venture capital spend right now. Um, you're going to have more and more of this, and who you take money from as a startup have downstream ramifications. So you need to start thinking about that. We we need to give that help founders understand the dynamics around that early in the start in the stage of the company, particularly in the new industry. Yep. So, you know, ranking, everyone's like, so show me the list. Like, how did the states rank? Here's a here's a top 10 list, right? Count of startups by state. Top 10. Um, so you count 
California and New York up there, but you also see Florida, Texas, Illinois, Delaware, Massachusetts, Washington, Colorado, and Georgia. Uh, pretty interesting. And then on this chart, it's like billions of dollars invested by VC by state. Um, so uh, you know, again, California and New York are at the top, and then we see a different ranking. Florida, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Texas, Delaware, Nevada, Illinois, and Georgia. Um, and I was, uh, when I first saw this report, I was like, wait, why you always not even in the top 10 for all of the marketing they do? That's pretty interesting. But they don't really have the re robust marketplace, right? Like in New York and California. They don't have the millions and millions of people. I mean, you can't even get an Uber ride at 7 p.m. in Wyoming. I've tried. Like, there's no Uber. Um, so it's uh, totally different. We also mark this against how they rank generally in the startup ecosystem. So what's interesting is Delaware, which ranks pretty low down, generally in startups. This is a financial technology. Makes sense why they'd be higher up, but um, that's a huge leap. Um, uh, likewise with uh, Nevada, where they're on, on the, uh, a mountain. Um, so these are kind of particular areas in the field where. Um, And in this report, we tried to just let the data speak for itself, right? Like, uh, there's probably questions that come to your mind. We want to know what those questions are because that will help inform, like, what a phase two of this report could look like. Uh, so keep those in mind because, you know, what we wanted to do is just create a baseline across all the states so that we have something to benchmark and then go from there in terms of questions to answer next. Yeah, so we talked a lot about the... Uh uh, incumbent investment in this space. Um, we highlighted a few, and I, I want to highlight, you know, clearly for the financial sector, you'd expect the banks to be looking at this. Um, $268 million is a, is a lot to invest. Uh, media is also looking at it, so I, I mean, media is not all inclusive, but we want to have a, a variety of, of call outs. Um, healthcare and then retail. Um, so this really spans, I mean, core technology that can affect all parts of the economy, but the um, a lot of the Fortune 1000 companies are, 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 are seeing that. Um, I think we have a number of, yeah, 176 of the 1000, so 27% um, of Fortune 5, no, correction. 123 yeah, are making investments? Correct. And then 276 out of the 1,000 are playing in the space, which I think is a very positive number, right? It's not 1,000, which would have been like crazy amazing, but 276 is a solid number out of the 1,000. Yeah. Overstock.com? Oh yeah, they've been in it forever, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the former uh, CEO, like he was on the road, like I mean, he built T0, which is like one of the larger uh, security uh, platforms. Um, for security tokens uh, back in the day. And he started doing that in like 2014, 15. He started really early in building that. So, uh, or even earlier than that, I can't remember. So, it's gonna, I could be wrong on these stats, but it's off the top of my head. Uh, anyone have, have their guess of how many Fortune 500 companies, well, Fortune 1000 companies are in Washington State? 20. It's around that, 18. Oh. Um, at least last time, last time I checked. How many are in Houston? Houston. Houston. Fortune 1000 companies? Close, okay, 50. Wow. Yeah. So, is I, oil? Houston, oil, yeah. Houston and Dallas. Yeah, and you, Dallas, I believe, is like 48. Mm -hmm. It's right around the same. Yeah. Um, I, I say that because we're in, in the Northwest and the West Coast in general, we're kind of immersed in startup culture. Um, but when you, when you think about, uh, that 27% of fortune 1000 companies investing in, a lot of those are, are, a lot of them are in cities that don't really have a startup economy. Um, and so when you see the outlier like Delaware and Nevada, or Nevada has a bit of a startup economy, but, um, that's an oddity in this space and it kind of stands out. <coughs> We also went for a geographic spread on these examples. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this, re this report is 
part, like, uh, was really, really interesting. I think we had, like, different slices and different versions of this, and we were like, no, that one, no, this one. But overall, like, what this said to me was, like, oh, despite what we hear about the government hating on us, they're actually spending more and more and more on Web3 year over year. Oh. And then I was like, oh, they're probably just investing in jobs or, like, workforce development or something like that. No, they're not. That, that number's actually kind of like, I mean, it goes up a little bit, workforce development. But, like, the Web3 use cases is like, shh. I mean, it's, it's like on a whole other planet compared to the other spending from the, the government. So I thought that was, like, really interesting. You know, what they say is not what they're actually doing. Now, I, I, want, I always like to caveat this slide a little bit because we're talking about tens of millions of million dollars. So from the government spend side, it's not a huge a lot of money. Uh, a huge amount of money, but that increase in spend is dramatic. Um, so when you talk about government spend and enterprise and Web3, the, the, the elephant in the room is, are they, what kind of blockchain are they using? Are they using public, private, consortium, IBM? Well, remember, that this, this report doesn't just cover blockchain or DLT, it covers like the whole swath of how we scoped up the word Web3. And so like some of this, um, like when you look at these examples or the specifics on what the federal funding is, it's like to research, you know, the use of digital identity technologies to blah, 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 blah. Or like, hey, to like look, use the uh, DLT and um, uh, <laughs> um, cryptography to secure like cybersecurity blah blah like it's it's like different specific projects like that but, and, and, but all those use cases are based in some built on some foundational layer sure. is that foundational layer decentralized technology um is it? That, that's a good follow-up question we didn't go down to that level cool. um it's it's an area i, I would like to yeah um but yeah we didn't take that angle. do you know good underwriters for that that question, <laughs> we can get at it. All right. Oh, well, okay. uh, you know, we'll follow up. We'll send out the full report to everyone. If there are pieces of data that you want us to look at for version two, send it over to us. Um, our hope is that this is a thing we can kind of refresh yearly and potentially can get it to be kind of a more updatable dashboard. But to your point, getting the initial contextual data out. So if there's a question, what do you think of? Day or six months from now, uh, definitely let us know. We can use that in the scope of the We'd like this to be the state of Web3's, um, the state of Web3 report to be the Mary Meeker of Web3. So the report that you look at every year to see, like, all right, how does our state do? Oh, we need to do more on the academic. Or this is the Washington State scorecard, or I call them battle cards. So this is our battle card. And, uh, you know, we have our you know, Washington excels at enterprise applications of Web3 technologies with strong incumbents, diverse startups, and significant investment. Yay! <laughs> However, if you look at our ecosystem mapping, where we could focus more on, um, and you know, we did okay, but we could do better, is around academia and government. And so, you know, as the Cascadia Blockchain Council, that's something that we're going to be focusing on even more as we go into 2024 building more relationships with the universities, colleges, community colleges, high schools, um, and also building more connectivity between public and private relationships and partnerships and uh, working with different government agencies and continuing that on. Um, investments, right? So like there are 61 companies with $738 million in investments. Top VC recipients are Protego Trust with $104.9 million. Eigenlayer in 2021 raised 71 plus million dollars. Story Protocol 2022 raised 30 million dollars. And CoinMe, hey, does anyone get some CoinMe? Or Darling Little CoinMe raised 26.43 million dollars. So there's a lot of good activity that's coming on in Washington. These are some very strong numbers. Uh, we have 123 startups. When I see one, two, three, I'm like, is that real? <laughs> but 123 startups uh, among 140 companies. 50% received at least one round of funding and two companies were acquired. So if you think about like the typical journey of a startup, I mean, you hear a lot of these overnight stories and they've been sweltering and 
hacking away in the trenches for 10, 15 years before they have their overnight success. And to realize that Web3 has only been around since 2007, 8, 2008, really, right? With the, with the birth of the Satoshi white paper. To like have that sort of turnaround is pretty amazing. So like um, Web3 is intense. Uh, incumbents. So 17, 14, 1,000 companies are headquartered there. Oh, Eight <laughs> companies have significant Web3 investment. And so those are uh, listed there, right? Amazon, Nordstrom, Microsoft, EXP, Google Lemon, Starbucks, Expedia, Boeing, T-Mobile. Yeah. And then government academia. So a lot of the focus areas are around group to group collaboration, privacy, consent management, enhancement, secure, and confidential identity management. So we list a number of funding agencies, active universities, top recipients, and we have about $1.6 million in federal funding. So Washington State, across every report I've done, so I have to say this every time, I'm sorry. We, we, we horribly underperform on the traction of government funding for, for startup activity. Why? So we don't like it, apparently. We don't like um, it or we don't well, apply I mean, or we don't get it. I don't think we apply. We don't apply. We don't, we don't apply. even apply. Huh? We don't even apply. We don't apply. Um, second is, I don't think necessarily uh, the founders I talked to, the question about the left. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I don't think they know how to apply to uh, FBR programs. Oh, really? So one, one thing that Nick and I are talking about is how we can increase, increase that in our programming yeah. for startups is helping them understand that it's, it's non-equity investment. There's some overhead, there's some red tape, but it's money going to your R&D that um, no one's on your gap table. Um, and so we should be making use of this. Actually, one PSA to that for the economics in the room, uh, there's an office, it's a government-funded office called PTAC, that's also Apex Accelerator is another name for it, and they like, have people there who will help walk you through, here's how I set up the grant portal, here's how I made the application, we'll walk you a lot of that, there's just unknown resource. There's two years going as part of the reason that we lack behind on this. Is it's a, that's what they were changing. Like, you got to talk about venture funding and all that kind of stuff all the time. We never mentioned FBIRs and FTTRs and the similar mechanisms. And so we're going to start talking about it more. But if anyone's interested in that list, let me know and we have some connections we can make for you. And like I said, there's government resources that just walk you through all the basics to actually try to submit an FBIR application, which but when you get it, it's, it's millions and millions of dollars. So maybe the next scorecard or the next battle card we have for Washington, instead of $1.6 million, we'll have $10.6 million. Yeah? Yeah? So I was, uh, um, I was running some numbers yesterday, looking at some of the VR companies that have received FDR in, in Washington State. And it turns out, of the three that have received them, two of them were ones that I told them about the program. Oh, so okay. that's are ones that I've told them about the program. Oh. So again, we need to start looking at it and applying because they, they, they're, we can get it. The competition is low, is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go after it. So for larger states that have a lot more activity, there's a page two of the battle card, and this is where we list out like the jobs. And so and this is sort of for a little policymaker conversations. Typically they go like, oh, blockchain jobs. Those are just like blockchain engineers. No normal human can do a blockchain engineer job. We're like, no, no, there's other jobs here. And so we listed out real companies like Circle Block, Bitrix, Amazon, Eigenlayer, Shrapnel, and then like the types of jobs that are out there and the salary ranges, right? So it's not just blockchain engineers. There's like HR, $215,000 to $305,000. That's, that's a lot of money, right? Uh, not just engineers. What else? We have head of product. We have security. We have recruiters. PR media. Yeah, PR and media. And, you know, then when you go to a policy you can go like, these jobs are not just blockchain engineers, super coders. These are real people and the salary ranges are from $60,000 to $300,000. That's real meaningful work for communities. And that's why you should care. And not join the anti-crypto task force by Ms. Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> right? Um, 
And then we have the, uh, the handful, the $1.6 million of federal funding. These are the recipients. Wicked Co-op, Express Rural Social, Social Voter Labs, and Respect Network. And so what do they receive the, uh, the funding for? To build software for decentralized organizations to optimize collaboration, innovation, and democratic ID governance using fractal group dynamics, as an example. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, there's more on, that, on this uh, scorecard if you want to read it. That's it. I guess. Oh, we have oh, Oregon, fuzzy. too. Really oh. Well, if you care about the Pacific to? Northwest, we also have Oregon, well, right? Just point out, Oregon has been really good at, at get securing government funds. Yeah. Um, and so, you you know, we should get taking our share. Yeah. Uh, um, significant retail, aerospace, advanced manufacturing, focused activity, uh, SILA, Rally, LO3 Energy, and Provenance Chain Network. And actually, Provenance Chain Network, I think, is one of the biggest recipients from the Department of Defense since then. They just were awarded uh, another big batch of money uh, this year. And they're probably accounting for a lot of that, like on, on the uh, government side. Yeah, yeah. So, Problem House Shape Network is probably uh, putting Oregon super on the map here. Um, you know, there's a good startup activity, some uh, definite incumbent activity with Nike and Intel. Um, but I think as a as a Pacific Northwest, you know, Team Washington, Oregon. We also like to include Idaho and. Uh, British Columbia is the Cascadia region. And so like, you know, when we look at this region all together, like it's a very powerful region, right? Like the GDP, the economic impact that we have, not just to our region, but to the United States is quite significant. The one thing that we could do better is apply for federal funding um, and then talk about the, the companies and uh, the wins that our fellow community members have more publicly, right? Like, you know, we, we should not be so quiet about it, but share the, the great stories of, you know, great entrepreneurs, investors that are just right here in our back neighborhoods. And that'll help raise the profile of the Pacific Northwest, which will bring in more entrepreneurs, which will bring in more investors, which will, you know, I mean, just raises the whole, right, a rising tide rises all ships, raises all ships. Um, so like the best thing that we can do as community members is amplify. You know, when you see a friend that's posting about their startup, like, like it and comment on it so that, you know, it gets amplified in the algorithms on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter, of, you know, share their stories and be like, congrats. Because um, the, the pie is much bigger than we can imagine. And we need to think big, um, think the glass is half full and, you know, really just help each other. It's not a competition. That's it. Uh, Questions? Anything we can go for? Oh, what I'm finding very interesting is uh, the connection between University of Washington and a lot of the startups were not necessarily having as strong of an <coughs> academic presence or representation in terms of blockchain. I, I'm, I'm saying that because when I when I read the report and also listened to both of you about how Delaware isn't necessarily represented as well in, uh, in the association. However, Morgan's, I'm, I'm going to be speaking at Morgan State in, uh, oh, that's the East I'm sorry. Um, there's like HBCUs such as Morgan State that have the FinTech Center. So just seeing how various schools are making sure to have like FinTech or blockchain center. I'm very surprised that uh, University of Washington and other some of these other universities here haven't invested in more academic. So it's an interest. So it, the academic data on this report was really hard to capture. The reason being <coughs> is there is a lot. So we kind of look at it in three dimensions, right? One is what kind of grants are experience for research. Two is where 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 are, what publications are coming out of the institution. And the third, which was student groups. Student groups. And we generally don't look at student groups that much, but it, it, for this technology, we really had to. Um, and what you notice is there's a lot, the so UW has very strong student groups look at communities of interest around what? Around what? Blockchain society, yes. 
they haven't been great about get, getting uh, grants and grants build centers and centers who, who created publications. Now there are, there's activity, yeah. but um, uh, you know, it really, you'll notice that uh, uh, Oregon State's in Maryland, right? Oregon State's in Maryland. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, and I don't know offhand whether they've received uh, grant money from this, yeah. but okay. So a, a grant results in a center, which results in uh, uh, research of being dedicated to that center and focusing on that knowledge. Um, yeah. But the University of Washington Tacoma has building a financial inclusion center and they have Bloomberg terminals and we're working with them to build out blockchain emerging technology curriculum. So like, you know, there's different, um, you know, each University of Washington is so big. And so, you know, we might be able to make more traction over there over the next year or so. So we'll see. And I, I don't know offhand, I think they might have some grant money. So I don't want to say that they don't. Have, don't. I'll, I'll go back and check. I, I totally understand. It's just that uh, I'm surprised. Yeah. Very, very surprised. I agree. And maybe we can do a more um, aligned partnership with Blockchain Society and UW and kind of help them with their rule about, hey, let's not just make this a social activity, let's let's have impact. If anybody wants to help well, with that. Uh, one of our policy priorities uh, next year is a short session, so I think it's this year next up, but it's created more degree certification programs and following what California did, kind of, which is actually getting the money to do that. And that way, it's you struggle with, that, with money to go do this, and it's legislatively mandated to create these, and it creates a little bit more urgency of like, let's do this now as opposed to, all right, let's get the advisory report together over the next year, and then five years from now, we'll create some curriculum. So, Terry's point, we found some success in the Tacoma or Wazoo, but um, that's a big legislative priority for us to get funding for the But if you know anybody at UW Watching Society that can help bring this up, yeah, love that. Yeah, a question kind of uh, on the data itself and like around different states. Um, like the, the mention of Delaware actually reminded me of that. So, like, like Delaware, for example, is a very popular state to incorporate in. It's very easy, very cheap. Uh, so does that have, like, and a lot of startups also tend to be uh, geographically, you know, remote. So does that affect the data at all? Is that like, or we, how are you judging? Yeah, we look for that, and we, we um, it's not where they're, we, we didn't, the data, these numbers aren't based on where they're incorporated, it's based on where they're based. Headquarters. Yeah. Got it. Um, so you could incorporate it in any state, my, my company is a Delaware-based company, but um, uh, we're headquartered here. That is interesting because I am a co-founder and CEO of two different companies and we're not totally distributed. We have no headquarters. We are incorporated. So how does that account if any into your report? Because in blockchain and web three, the umbrella of that industry, that is pretty commonplace, at least for early stage businesses and startups. Yeah. And so, you know, what consideration, if any, or how is that determined or was that taken? How to so, get what is your pitch profile say? Sorry, sorry. What, what is your crunch base profile say? Pitch base. Well, so we're self funded. So you don't have a crunch base? So we don't have it. Okay. Yeah. So you might not even be in our data. And I'm saying I'm not built. There's a lot of Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm talking distributed like, across the globe too. But yeah, I mean, so I'm not saying this is all inclusive. Uh, no, we look at over 100 data sets, but there, there are many companies that might not even appear on them. Um, this was looking at only publicly available data, right? So if there was like private funding events um, as it happens, those wouldn't be captured in this report. Makes sense. But it, it allows us to at least set a benchmark and a base foundational set of Yeah, this is an amazing by the way, so I'm really stoked to see it. And then specifically for Washington, because I'm here, I'm based here, I know it, it is the room too. It's good to see familiar faces in you. Um, what do you see as the opportunities coming up? Maybe not so much like this year, but maybe the year to come. You know, a lot of things like funding all of a sudden becomes available for like annual budgets on the calendar year. Um, there's a big, you know, election of things coming up too. It's like there's a lot of stuff on the horizon. Where do you see with what you know from this and just anecdotally as kind of those emerging sectors of or opportunities for emerging so, startups. I'm going to be a little bit guarded on that answer just because I haven't done a deep dive 
that we, and with this report, we focused on a baseline across the country. Um, I do think uh, from this preliminary, and I'd love to do more a deeper dive. Um, from the pre preliminary research, I would say you know, clearly we're not making use of uh, uh, undilated investment and opportunities that are out there. We're also, um, I think there is a, I think the recognition of the corporate demand nationally um, and the international investors that are looking in space is an area where startup founders who are looking for investment and uh, companies that might want to pilot the solutions. Um, it's an area that I think I there's less activity in that space. And, and, and the doctrine. And then I can talk broadly across the US and then you know apply it to Washington State. Like Washington State, we're supposed to be the epicenter for enterprises, right? And enterprises have been working on this stealthily year over year. Um, but one of the biggest needs that we have as we talk to policymakers across the states, US, you know, state by state, and also in DC is that Policymakers want to hear about these use cases, and we don't have these use cases documented in a repeatable fashion. Um, so, like when they say, like, "Well, where are the use cases?" And we're like, "Oh, there's so many." <laughs> like in healthcare, and like they're not at the tip of our fingertips. We don't have the data. We don't have the case studies. And so, whatever we can do to like bubble up those use cases, um, we're working on this as a project as the USBC and. I think states are also working on it, but if there are favorite use cases that you want to see in a formalized template, like please, you know, bubble those up and get those um, out um, so that we can do that. Or you know, just um, and and policymakers want to hear about non-crypto specific use cases too. So it's really important that you know we. I think there's like enterprises that are exploring, haven't really figured out their platform and point of view on how they're going to approach this space, even though they've been investing in it. And so, you know, if you have com friends that are working on it in the Web3 department or their stealth department and said company, like, you know, what can we do as a community to help them, help us, help us all, right? You know, do we do brainstorming or do you need consultants or do you need resources or do you need trusted referrals or do you just need a hug? I don't know. Right? <laughs> I think there's a lot of people that have like PTSD in this space. Just you. they're they're you know a little bit worried about like I don't want to make a mistake and I don't I don't want to be the one that like that comes out and then is wrong or like all my competitors copy me. So there's a little bit of that going on. Um, but I think enterprises will we, we need the enterprises here in this state to come out. So help us come out with those. Or if you're a startup that's working with enterprises, like hey, I see you bring on your clients. Hey, I love working with you. Can we do a case study on you? I'd love to do that. Interesting point, and I'm not dogging on Oregon in any way, so don't take it that way. But uh, Washington State receives about four times as much federal funding uh, as Oregon does. Yeah, that number on Oregon is significantly higher than the number here, um, with you know, a third of the companies. So that's an area where I think we can do a lot there. Maybe the data wasn't cut this way, but is it doesn't appear to be any correlation between the regulatory regime and how friendly it is to Web3 and the level of investment. It's almost sort of a more network effect, right? Where like California, New York, because like Wyoming doesn't have a whole lot of activity. So that was an area that we talked about about starting to look into, and I was like, let's not go there on this one. <laughs> um, 
there, there doesn't seem to be a correlation at all. Um, yet, that's often what you hear about in terms of media coverage. Yeah. Um, but I'd love, I, before I say that definitively, I, I think there needs to be more analysis there. And then, um, I've always asked a lot of startups around, like, what do you, when you ask for the regulatory clarity, what do you mean? And uh, the most common answer I hear is like, what do I have to do to not go to jail? If that's what we, if that's what we mean by regulatory clarity, there's like a, there's a big gap in like, what policymakers think regulatory clarity means and what us plebs, normies think uh, regulatory clarity means. And there, there needs to be some sort of conversation or gap that needs to be had there because, you know, Entrepreneurs don't want to go to jail for trying and being innovative, right? And yeah, policymakers don't want to send you to jail. They just want to collect your taxes and make sure you're not scamming customers, right? So. Yeah. Now, I've noticed any, uh, speaking of all this kind of negative regulatory clarity concept, um, did you notice any like, regression in jobs that were posted? I know that I saw a bunch of numbers of more jobs being posted, but uh, I'm sure there were a ton of startups that went out of business and could no longer support their employees any longer. So, was there any regression that was correlated to the? Yeah, well, we were also the, the job postings was kind of a snapshot in time. Sure. So, if we, we don't really have longitudinal data there to be able to assess, right? Yeah. The knowledge of time out there. <laughs> Just a second question to you. Um, like I've heard a lot of people talking about like, and this has happened since I've been involved in this space, uh, just like rebranding of you know blockchain, crypto, Bitcoin, Web three. Do you? How have you been feeling about using the Web three brands? Do you think it's much more encompassing? Do you think it confuses people? What are your thoughts around just the overall brand of Web3 these days, and yeah, just kind of curious. Is I think it's a lot more clear um, and specific, whereas, uh, and it's, it doesn't have as much of a problem of being conflated with so many other things. Like even the word blockchain and Bitcoin and crypto, there's a lot of terminology definition conflation going on. And so when one person says blockchain, they mean something totally different than when another person says blockchain, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, I think Web3 is a lot more clear. Also, it has a lot more of a positive, um, acceptable connotation. connotation. Yeah, people are just more amenable when they're like, you start, blah, 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 Web3, they're like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Versus you're like, blah, 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 they're like, blah. So it's, there's so much negativity associated with Bitcoin and blockchain right now. And we need to change that because um, people shouldn't be anti-technology, right? Like you're not gonna hate a hammer because it's red or black, right? So, uh, you know, we shouldn't be hating on the technology. And that's, again, like another reason where we want to talk about all the different use cases, especially those that are being used and implemented by enterprises who are, you know, legit Fortune 5, 1000, you know, incumbents uh, that kind of normalize that this is technology that you're going to be seeing or using or not even seeing, right? Um, that'll help you be more secure and be more digital and more connected. So are we are even working on the report. We went through a number of names, uh, thinking <laughs> yeah. of how, how, what we what we call it. We call uh, it originally the Bat Report. Yeah, the Bat. Uh, <laughs> the blockchain based. It, well, I don't even know what that I don't recall event, but what we, <gasps> but um, you know, we we talked, we flirted with distributed ledger technology at one point at the. Um, Sponsors had different inputs, right? And, 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 and uh, um, but Web three I like a lot because there's a story behind it too, right? And the story, like Web one, was markup language, right? That's, that's the idea of te uh, markup text to create the web. Web two was the enablement technology of the web services and the commerce layer. Um, web three is a whole host of technologies that enable you to have distributed commerce, right? Um, and it's kind of making a statement of what the future web will look like, but it's also tells a story of how important this 
advanced technology is for the future of the web. Um, I, I've grown to like using it um, uh, because I think it paints a picture of where we are. Potentially made a future. Web3 also has users in a way that blockchain and crypto don't have users, which is exciting to me. Yeah. You talk to like the people in the open of the more, I think. How do we get more users though? That's the that's the real big question is how do we get more people using Web3 apps? Uh, I have too many opinions on that to even What's that? I have too many opinions on that to Yeah, I know we'll have to yeah. sync up my wife here in a couple of I'm kind of related like no like Terminology, right? But we maybe being like the most uh, kind of even. To, you know, I think a big part of that is because, like, we like we were talking earlier, like if you go like to like Twitter, a lot of those spaces, it feels like about eighty percent of the conversation is about uh, not so much like what three, but uh, various facets of uh, what we call ponsonomics, right? Uh, like shills for various meme coins, uh, NFT rug pull yeah. projects, all this stuff, right? That that feels like eighty percent of the conversation. If you just go to like any online community and look for like Web3 spaces. So like, are there any like organizations and stuff that may be focusing on kind of drowning some of it out and showing like the cool use cases? Like, because I, I think that's a big portion of like why we have to, why we have to worry about like the word we're using is because when people go to investigate this, they have to wade through, you know, layers of crap, right? And I think we need to change that as like a community. Yeah. And I'm not sure how we do that though, but I think it's related to your question. So, I just came back from New York and one of the ideas was like, we've never actually created a self-regulatory organization. We've never self-regulated as an industry. It's really centralized. How can you self-regulate, right? Right. And so like maybe we, we need to figure out how to centralize and call out, you know, members from different communities and have a SRL, a self-regulatory organization that kind of becomes this go-to source that, you know, communities can lean on and incumbents and you know, governments and policymakers can lean on to figure out, you know, who's who in this game because, you know, no one wants to be, you know, made fun of or taken taken to town on, you know, just, we want to keep people safe as much as possible. But then also, as a decentralized sort of, like, community, we want to be vocal, right? Like, we want to be vocal about, like, the goods, you know, the people that are doing great, but we also want to call out people that are just not doing great, right? You know, usually a lot of us, we like, oh, I'll just ignore them. No, I think we need to call it like this person's not cool. Why are you pointing at me? Oh no, I don't. <laughs> I'm pointing at the tree. I'm pointing at the tree. The tree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to work with that one. Yeah. 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 Ye
abstraction layer in order to get people to actually use the tech, the underlying technology, and I feel like that's kind of where we're at right now, but at the same time, you have people around the world who are now able to create NFTs and get their artwork out there and actually be rewarded for creativity that they have. Um, that they have, and, and that breaks down a whole different barrier of, of entry for individuals who are trying to have a more equitable future for themselves. So, so there's different factions of this whole space, and how do we yeah, massage so, them all? So the reason that I asked because one, I think that like you get a very cogent answer on that, and most people don't, right? Um, it's on you. Yeah. Um, so I think one, those stories need to be told a little bit better, which like locally, Nikwire does a great job of doing the startup spotlight. But I'd love to see a series of use cases, uh, cases around a uh, Web3 startup spotlight. Just to, and then the other thing is making it personalized. And you start to make, I cut you off a little bit because I want to talk to you afterwards, but sure. um, uh, it's about big talk pulling through how that then affects you, right? So the earlier part of your response, you liquidity in the bond market, right? That affects everyone in terms of um, managed portfolios for uh, retirement accounts, right? So drawing it back, because this is not at its core a consumer technology, it's a platform technology. So it's really hard to explain without getting, tracking it back to them either. Um, and I think that story needs to be told. That'd be an interesting place to track investment and success too. Like the way I explain blockchain to my mother is, if you rewire your house, you're not going to know that, right? And that's 85, 90 percent of blockchain technology. And then the other five percent, there's the light switch. That's totally different. That's going to be really hard. It's so salient to me that you said that there's so much going on in the enterprise, right? And it government, it'd be really cool to be able to see the numbers associated with that as people start to realize what blockchain is actually for, you know, versus all of these spiky NFT, you know, garbage coins. Yeah. Because those are the things that get all this play, but the quiet power is in the invisible wiring. Plumbing. Oh. Plumbing. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to betray my age here, but I, as, you're, as we're talking here, I keep on thinking of the, the old the movie The Net. Do you guys remember know that? Remember that? Which one? The Net. Oh, Sandra Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was the first time I saw someone order a pizza online, <laughs> and half the people, half, half my friends at the time, were like, "That's stupid," and the other half were like, "That's the coolest thing in the world." But it set an idea of what web-based commerce could be. Very stupid example. Selling books online is stupid. It was an idea. I agree. Right. Uh, but that built the whole way for Web 2, right? Or Web 1 and Web 2, but yeah. On the um, same topic, oh. sorry, see, uh, the founder of Grubhub uh, did a book, an audio book called Hangry, that talks about like that exact scenario. It's a great reader. Listen, highly recommend it. Startups in general, but also like that, that transition of yep. this brand new technology no one's ever thought of really. Like, just, just right on the nose of what you said about boarding pizza. Like, didn't interrupt you. No, 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 great. I think we need that story. <laughs> we need more stories. Please help us. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, like, the way I see it, Web 3 is replacing the Web 2. But the problem is that it has to be on par with it in the service that we're going to have to So I've been starting with Odyssey, which is the underlying, right? How do I do this more? But as I'm in the community building that, it's just like you know, to hear that I get one of the values where you got a whole bunch of points and it's starting to reserve. It's like part of that. And obviously buying it in, in the open for the, the marketplace and knowing that it's, it's definitely I think generational. I mean, a little bit older myself, I think mean, the younger generation values the digital, and we're going to still miss that shift. But it's like, I think you mentioned it's an underlying. And to be honest, being from the Philippines, unless it's taken away from you, you really still think you own that. <laughs> but you really don't, right? People think they own it until it's taken away. And I think a lot of paths 